Would you pray with me? Come Holy Spirit, as we have prepared our hearts coming to worship you, to worship our God, to worship our King, Jesus, now we need your help to listen to the word that God has for us today. During this time of thanksgiving, we give thanks that Jesus came and lived among us, that he died for us, and that God raised him from the dead in victory over sin and death, that we might have life through faith in him. Help us as we listen to the word today to think about what that life should look like. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Is there anything that would cause you to lose your faith? Is there anything that would cause you to lose your faith? This was a question that one of my seminary professors asked one day in class. And of course, since everyone in the class was preparing for vocational ministry, we assured our professor that there was nothing that could cause us to lose our faith. But our professor continued to press, saying, if there is nothing that could cause you to lose your faith, then what is your faith based on? Well, some of my classmates gave some very good answers to that question. But our professor again asked us, are you sure there's nothing that could cause you to lose your faith? Well, we sensed that there was something we were missing that was important. And though we were still sure there was nothing that could cause us to lose our faith, the room got quiet as we all tried to figure out what our professor was getting at. Finally, a young man said, well, there is one thing that would cause me to lose my faith. And the professor asked, and what is that one thing? And the young man quietly replied, if Jesus' bones were found. Have you ever pondered the fact that the Christian faith is based on something that was not there, something that was missing when Jesus' followers went to the tomb where Jesus' dead body had been placed, the tomb was empty. Jesus' body was not there. And that is a very significant part. That is a foundational part of our faith. For almost two years, we've been studying Jesus' life and ministry as it is described in the Gospel of Luke. And according to Luke's account, Jesus was an awe-inspiring teacher. He was an amazing healer. He was the greatest prophet ever. Jesus was compassionate, caring, and controversial. Jesus was controversial. Jesus proclaimed the coming of the kingdom of God. And Jesus called his followers to live according to the counter-cultural values of God's kingdom. Jesus also questioned the religious leaders and challenged their authority. And because of this, the religious leaders conspired to have Jesus crucified. Now, all of this makes for an interesting, perhaps even an inspiring story. But we probably would never have even heard this story except for what happened next, except for what was missing. And so as we read our scripture passage for today, let's think about why what was missing is so important to us and to our faith. Our scripture reading is found in Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. You can begin to find that if you're going to look at that in your Bible or in the Pew Bible, Luke 24, 1 through 12. But before I read this passage, I want you to remember what happened just before this. In chapter 23, we read about how Jesus was crucified, how he died on the cross, and how he was buried. And in the final verses of chapter 23, we read, The women who had come with him, with Jesus, from Galilee, followed, and they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. 
And then they returned and prepared spices and ointments. On the Sabbath, they rested according to the commandment. And now, today's passage continues on. Luke 24, starting with verse 1. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they, the women, came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed down their faces, bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you? while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified, and on the third day rise again? Then they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mo mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had happened. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So the first ones to realize that the tomb was empty were some women who had been following Jesus since before he left Galilee. We first read about these women in chapter 8, where Luke tells us that the twelve were with Jesus, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward Chusa, and Susanna, and many others, who provided for them... Jesus and his followers out of their resources. And in chapter 23, Luke pointed out a couple of times that these women who had followed Jesus all the way from Galilee watched from a distance. They saw Jesus die on the cross. And then these women followed and saw the tomb where Jesus' dead body was buried. These women were fully convinced that Jesus was dead because they went and prepared spices and ointments to bring back to the tomb in order to give him a proper burial. After resting on the Sabbath, according to their Jewish religion, these women returned to the tomb as soon as they could, very early the next morning, to finish their burial tasks. They expected to find Jesus' dead body in that tomb. But Jesus' body was not there. Now, because we know the story and what happens next, we know what the empty tomb means. But when they arrived and found the tomb empty, these women did not understand the meaning of the missing body. Now, these women, along with the twelve and perhaps other disciples, had followed Jesus for a long time time. They had heard Jesus proclaim the coming of the kingdom of God, and they expected to see that kingdom come. They had not expected Jesus to die, even though Jesus had told them on several occasions that he would die and that he would be raised from the dead. For example, in chapter 9, verse 22, Jesus said, The Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And according to chapter 18, verses 31 through 33, Jesus said to the twelve, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished, for he will be handed over to the Gentiles, and he will be mocked and insulted and spat upon. After they have flogged him, they will kill him, and on the third day he will rise again. Jesus had told his followers that he... He was going to die and be raised again. He had told them what was going to happen to him when they got to Jerusalem. But they were shocked when he was killed, and they did not understand the empty tomb. 
They did not understand that Jesus had been raised from the dead, even though he had told them. Now we wonder why did they not remember what Jesus had said to them? Why did they not remember that he had said he was going to be crucified and raised from the dead? Why didn't they remember? But do we remember everything that Jesus said? We've read almost the whole Gospel of Luke. Do we remember everything he said? Or do we only remember the parts that we like? God sent angels to remind the women of what Jesus had said. The angel said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee? That the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Remember? And then the women remembered what Jesus had said. And they went to Jesus' followers and they told them that the tomb was empty and what the angels had said. But the apostles did not believe them. Those women, you know how women are. The apostles did not believe what the women had said. But Peter did go to the tomb to check it out for himself. And though he saw that the tomb was empty, just as the women had said, and he was amazed by this, Peter did not understand the meaning of the empty tomb. Peter and the others needed more than an empty tomb to believe that God had raised Jesus from the dead. Their faith was still based on their own expectations about the Messiah. You see, the apostles, along with many others of their time, had expected the Messiah, and Messiah means anointed one, and in their understanding, anointed to be king, like all the kings that they had had in the past, not recently, but in a long past, the kings of Israel, that's what they were expecting, a Messiah to restore the kingdom of Israel and to reign in power. The apostles believed that Jesus was the Messiah, so they expected Jesus to establish an earthly kingdom like David had had, and they expected to be a part of that kingdom. After Jesus was arrested, hung on a cross, died, and was buried, they expected Jesus to remain dead. In other words, their expectations were those of the kingdoms of this world world. They had low expectations. And even after Peter saw for himself that the tomb was empty, the apostles' understanding of the situation was determined by their low expectations. And I wonder, how often is our understanding of our situations determined by our low expectations? When we experience difficult times, when our prayers are not answered the way that we hope, do we assume that God has not heard our prayers or that God has not acted on our behalf? Do we consider the possibility that God may actually be acting in much greater, more amazing ways than we can even imagine? Do we fail to understand the meaning of our empty tombs because we do not listen to Jesus' words or we do not act on what Jesus said? Do we ignore what Jesus has said because of our low expectations? If the disciples had listened and believed what Jesus had said earlier about the necessity of his death and resurrection, they would have understood the meaning of the empty tomb. If we would listen and act upon what Jesus has said, how would that change how we perceive the world and the situations that we face? How would it change our expectations? We claim to follow Jesus. We claim that we believe what Jesus said. And yet, as we have studied the things that Jesus said again and again in the Gospel of Luke, do we really 
Do we really intend to live the way that Jesus calls us to live? Jesus proclaimed the coming of the kingdom of God in which the values are completely opposite of those of the kingdoms of this world. How well do we adopt the values of the kingdom that Jesus proclaimed? How do we live out Jesus' call to bring good news to the poor? Do we really expect the one who raised Jesus from the dead to transform our lives and use us to change the world so that it becomes more and more like the kingdom of God that Jesus proclaimed? If we do not believe these things, if we do not expect these things, then do we really understand the meaning of the empty tomb? When the women and Peter came to the tomb and looked inside, they realized that the body was missing. But they did not understand what this meant, because something else was also missing. What was also missing was their belief that what Jesus had said was true. I want to suggest to you that the reason that the world today is so unlike the kingdom of God that Jesus proclaimed is because those of us who claim to follow Jesus do not really believe what Jesus said. Enough to apply it in our own lives. I suspect that we have low expectations. We do not expect to change the world. Many of you have probably heard the story about a man walking along the beach. He saw a boy throwing starfish into the ocean. Any of you know that story? The man asked the boy what he was doing, and the boy replied, throwing starfish back into the ocean. The surf is up and the tide is going out. If I don't throw them back, they'll die. Son, the man said, don't you realize that there are miles and miles of beach and thousands of starfish? You cannot make a difference. The man had low expectations. After listening politely, the boy bent down, picked up another starfish, threw it back into the ocean, and then smiling at the man said, I made a difference for that one. The boy had higher expectations. This story was written some time ago, and it has an inspiring message that we can each do our small part to make the world a little better. But I think Jesus came to call us to make more than a small difference on our own. I think Jesus' message was that if we who believe in him would actually obey his teaching, then together we can truly change the world. And I think that this is even more true today than ever before. If the story of the starfish had been written for today, perhaps it will go something like this. A man was walking along the beach and saw a girl taking a picture of a starfish with her iPhone. Approaching the girl, the man asked, what are you doing? Uploading pictures of these stranded starfish on my Facebook page and asking friends to tweet the call to action. The surf is up and the tide is going out. If I can get enough friends out here, we can get all of these starfish back into the ocean before sunset. Little girl, the man said, what does tweet mean? The girl rolled her eyes, bent down, picked up a starfish and threw it back into the ocean and then said, if you want to help, this is how you do it. Within hours, thousands of children stormed the beach and every starfish was rescued. The man did not expect that all of the starfish could be rescued. He thought that the problem was too big for anyone to solve, but the girl expected that every starfish could be saved, which led her to take action, not alone, but with the help of many others who shared her expectation. But that is not the end of the story. As the last starfish was tossed into the ocean, the children celebrated their accomplishment on the beach. It had been a good day for them and for the starfish. But one boy faced the ocean deep in thought. The girl went to him and asked, What's up? Still gazing into the distance of ocean and imagination, the boy said, 
How did it happen in the first place? And how do we make sure it never happens again? Friends, our world is not as God created it to be. Jesus came to redeem our world. Jesus came to restore our world to the way that God created it. And Jesus calls us to join him in making that happen. Do you expect that we can do it? The power that raised Jesus from the dead is the power that is available to us to do what Jesus calls us to do. May we believe in what Jesus said with faithful resolve. And may we join together with others who believe what Jesus said in order to change the world into the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for sending Jesus to show us how to live in relationship with you. It's so easy for us to live in the world as it is. It's the only world we've known. And yet Jesus calls us to join him in changing the world into the world that he described when he taught about the kingdom of God. It's a high calling. Help us to have high expectations. Help us to receive the power that you offer to us through the Holy Spirit. Join together with Jesus and with one another to apply the words that Jesus taught us to change the world. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.